But when we move to the gospel, um, Jesus ties all of this message together, speaking to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste with what can it be seasoned, it's only good to be thrown out. Again, he says, you are the light of the world, a city on a mountain cannot be hidden. That's a transparent allusion to Jerusalem. Right. We'll come back to that. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand. That again, probably a transparent allusion to the holy place where the lights are placed on the lampstand within the temple. Uh, gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. So uh, this is, again, uh, Scott, near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus is acting as a new Moses, going up on a mountaintop, teaching people now the new law of the new covenant, which will involve some corrections of Moses in subsequent uh, passages. But here, this, this whole passage, as I point out in the text, is, is really full of temple imagery. Salt and light were associated in the temp with the temple. Salt was used as a sign of purification with the sacrifices. Uh, light was associated with the temple, especially the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the quintessential temple feast during which the temple was lit up 24-7 for eight days and illuminated the whole city of Jerusalem. And so our Lord is saying to his disciples, you are going to become a temple. You're going to become the replacement for the stone temple of Jerusalem. That's a theme that is already kind of uh, implicit in the Gospels, but then it gets developed much more by St. Paul, for example, in uh, his epistle to the Ephesians, where the temple ecclesiology or the, uh, the, the nature of uh, God's people as his house in the new covenant really comes to the fore. And so we are the temple. We, the disciples of Christ, are the temple. And so we need to let our light shine, just as the temple was regarded as a light for the whole nation. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean calling attention to ourselves. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to urge us to do our acts of piety in secret, and our Father who sees what in secret, what is done in secret, uh, will see, will know that. But this, I believe, is speaking of allowing our actions to speak louder than words, not in that we're being ostentatious or having an ad campaign, like you mentioned, to uh, to call attention to the fact that we're giving to the poor or making acts of sacrifice. But again, as they often say, actions speak louder than words. And when we consistently lead this lifestyle of instantiating jubilee in the way that we live and the way that we treat our neighbors and our family members and our fellow parishioners, eventually that can't be hidden. That comes out in a more powerful kind of light, all the more so because we don't uh, you know, take some kind of effort to call attention to it. And in that way, it becomes a beacon, a lighthouse calling people to the safe haven, which is the church, God's jubilee for the world. Whenever you summarize and synthesize the passages for the upcoming Sunday, there's always a sense of accumulative growth, you know, that it's not just, oh, let's connect the dots <laughs> thematically. There really is a sense in which there's the growth that is revealed in history that the scripture bears witness to that we, if we have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, can pick up on this because so much of it is dramatically personalized by our Lord. He is the son of the father. He is the temple. He is the high priest. And so instead of just being cultic categories drawn from the ancient liturgy of Jerusalem, there really is a sense in which <coughs> The light that is shining could also be characterized in terms of divine hospitality. Mm. You know, I was thinking of that when you were referring to 1 Corinthians 2, because here is Paul reminding them of how he came in weakness and fear with much trembling, and yet they welcomed him. So as he is extending the message of divine hospitality, that he is going to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, care for all of us in Christ, they're doing the same thing. It's almost like priming the pump, that what you were doing naturally for me in my weakness, you know, I was going to do, or God was going to do it for you through me, supernaturally, you know. Mm -hmm. And I also see that in the Psalm. Psalm 112, there is this idea of hospitality being extended to the poor, to all of the needy. And that is the most powerful light of all. In fact, conversely, I was thinking as you were describing this, 
What is the sign of inhospitality? Well, a closed door that is locked and windows that are shut because the lights are off to outsiders. But when you turn on the light, there really is a sense in which you pick up the theme from Isaiah. You share your bread with those who are mm -hmm. hungry. Well, you don't just do that by dropping it off at you know, the shelter. Right. You invite them 